It's a load-in show, folks. It's a load-in. After the long drive all the way up from Brattleboro. Uh, my name's Ted Lawrence. I am a circus artist. Ringling Brothers. I've traveled all over the world collecting circus tricks and circus skills and stories to share with my audiences. And I feel very, very lucky to be able to share them with you this evening. My circus career started in 1986. I was uh, lucky enough to be accepted into something called the Ringling Brothers and Barman Bailey Clown College. 50 people were accepted that year. 7,000 people applied. Statistically, it was harder to get into than Harvard. The pool wasn't exactly the same, but statistically. And as a result of Clown College, I wound up getting invited to perform for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. I was in the 117th edition. Ringling Brothers had been going already for 117 years by the time I got there. It pulled up its stakes for the last time two years ago. It's gone. Um, and, and that's why I'm here today, is to share with you some memories and experiences that I had with one of the oldest, iconic American institutions. Ringling Brothers and Barn Bailey Circus has been around since before baseball. It was the second most recognized brand in the world behind Coke. Um, if somebody said circus, more than nine out of 10 times, people would say Ringling Brothers or vice versa, all right? And I got to go in the heyday of the 20th century. 1987 is when I trained. Uh, we did winter quarters in 1986. In 1987, uh, I got to tour with them uh, for about two years. Oh, what am I talking for? It's load in. I got to get ready for a show. Um, all right, so we've got, oh wait, we'll open it up this way. Ah, woo! It's a little obstacle on the floor. <laughs> So there were 26 of us on the road, and it was called trunks when you loaded in. After you'd slept all night on the train or whatever, you got in the next day and you'd load in your trunks. 26 of us would set up our trunks side by side. My trunk had been Enoff's trunk first. Enoff, when I was a first of May. First of May is a term that can be said either with uh, passion or uh, with despair. Uh, it's for the first year clowns. Circuses always used to leave on the first of May. And uh, oops, this one needs one more extension on it. So uh, if you were new to the circus, they called you a first of May. Anyways, first of May had to drag the trunks into the alley. Oh, the alley is where all the clowns got ready. It was our, our, not just our dressing quarters, it was where we lived. During daylight hours, it was where we lived. We were either out on the floor or we were in the alley. Unless it was between shows, you might get a few minutes to go out and see what's around the, uh, the building a little bit. But mostly you were either in the alley or doing a show. All right. I liked Enos trunk because it had a closet. And it was bigger than the trunk that I had as a first of May. So I was very happy to pick it up. Now that extension is in there for a reason that you'll see in a minute. And I didn't have it with me when I was on the road. John! Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> there we go. All right. Let's see. Anyways, there'd be a bunch of curtains set up in the building. Oh, we toured the uh, civic centers and convention centers around the United States. We lived on a train. The train was a mile long. All 125 performers lived on the, lived on the train. 125 support people for the, for the show. Another 25 people support people for the train. About 350 people lived on the train. Almost all the animals lived on the train. Um, there were a couple of animals that didn't live on the train, but uh, I think we had 30-some horses that stayed on the train, traveled from town to town. Uh, 25, 26 elephants were on the train, two llamas, uh, 22, 24 cats, something like that, a whole lot of cats. A um, couple, couple of camels named Benson and Hedges. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we learned a little bit about being immodest in the circus. I'm just going to change right here, folks, if you don't mind. We've got a show to do in just a few minutes, and it uh, usually takes me about a 45 minutes to get my makeup and costume on. Sometimes if load-in takes a little while longer, you're in a little bit of trouble. My, you do extra work for extra money in the circus. It's called cherry pie. My extra job was called electric. I'd load in uh, 
the uh, cables, unwrapped cables, time on the rig before they flew the, the rig in the air, because all the lights and all the sound system had miles and miles of cables. So that was my job. Let's see, I've got some pants here to change into. <laughs> Yeah, they're still pants. One of those things. Got a half from Clown. Oh, and I should have a shirt here, too. Yeah. That's a yeah, good shirt. To wear. Yeah, okay, good. Ah, it's good to keep that around for emergencies as well. All right. Yeah, and a couple other. Oh, this is a good thing. This is my, my bathrobe. Yeah, it's got a hood on it because we had to run through the building after the show and it, with your makeup on and your costume off. And I hated that because people would say, look at the clown with no clothes on. And, you know, so with the hood up, I, I looked a little bit more like Darth Vader, but nobody bothered me. And that was, was to my, my benefit. All right, I'm got to put these out here. There's a couple other pieces of wardrobe that we've got. And that... Uh, a little bit. Oh, my socks. I forgot about my socks. Oh, here's the first thing I, I made at Clown College with some clown underwear out of the scraps. This is the scraps from Clown College. It's pretty colorful stuff. And yeah, let's have some socks out here and get those ready to go too. And my acrobatic shoes. Put those up here as well. And uh, oh, oh, my regular shoes. You know what? I'm going to share these with you because you've probably never seen anything like these before. <laughs> Genuine circus clown That's shoes. Awesome. Don't lick the bottoms because no, the elephants are not housebroken. Yeah. Okay? Oh, but pass those around. <laughs> check them out. Yeah, everybody gets a chance oh, no. to experience them. Yeah. And I'm going to... I don't like being on this side of the trunk because uh, it's a little less, uh, less sociable. So I'm going to move my trunk a little bit here. Uh, no, I think we're okay. i going to wind up this far over. Ah, all right, and then uh, here we're gonna do this. Thanks, Dave. All right, and uh, one more thing we're gonna do because I brought something really special. You weren't allowed to, in 1986. People didn't have cell phones. Only a couple of people had video cameras. So uh, Super 8, High 8. And uh, regular film is what was used to take pictures. And cameras weren't allowed in the alley. But guess what? I've got pictures. <laughs> and uh, if we can get everything to start up, I plan on sharing them with you tonight. Um, these pictures, only a few of them were taken by myself personally. Most of them have come from Facebook. Because thanks to the miracle of modern media, I'm in touch with the people I used to tour with in the circus. Even though I was from Vermont, and when I left, you know, I said goodbye. Well, you don't say goodbye, you say see you down the road. And I, every once in a while I get to cross paths with them, but not very often. Um, Thanks to Facebook, we've all been sharing pictures with each other. So I'm not going to run any um, audio with it. These are just going to be pictures. Uh, they're not going to be up for very long. No audio. There we go. All right. Well, that's pretty, pretty small. You guys can't even see that, can you? <laughs> if it was there, it would work better, right? Fortunately, we have Bryant here to boost us up. So these are some other adventures I've had since I left Ringling Brothers, because I figured I'd have to spend some time getting this screen to focus for you guys. Is that... If I do that, is it better? Is that good? All right. On with the show. So, let me get ready. Oh, my shoes came back. Great. That's important. 
You need your shoes. You gotta put your shoes on first. I only got paid $185 a week. Um, well, that was before they took out $10 a week to live on the train. <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you about my room on the train. My room on the train was 43 inches wide, and I'll bet if you measure that, it's within one inch of 43 inches. And it was 71 inches long. It had to be that way, because there were 18 of us living on the car. The clown car had 18 clowns living on it. Um, the 18 of us shared the clown car, which we had a little, it was called a roomette. We uh, had two, uh, four sinks and two toilets. Uh, no showers. Showers were at the building. Remember, I had to run through just like Darth Vader to get to the showers. Um, we had a kitchen. Well, that's a bit of an overstatement. We had a, a four-burner stove and an oven and a microwave. We had eight uh, dormitory fridges that the 16 of us shared, which uh, doesn't sound like much, but in fact, it was enough because we weren't there very much. Pretty much, it just slept on the train. Um, anyways, got paid $185 a week for the job, paid $10 a week to stay on the train. Oh, and then I also had to pay 25 cents each way to ride the bus from the train to the building on the circus bus. <laughs> yeah, and on weekends when they ran a, a shopping bus, that was 50 cents each way. Um, that really rubbed me the wrong way. I usually rode my unicycle. For anything less than 10 miles, I'd ride my unicycle each way. Anyways, if you were late for an entrance, it was a $10 fine. We only got paid $12 a show. You didn't want to be late. That's why I'm putting my shoes on first. You see, it turns out, if you're running late, you can run and put on your wig, and you can run and put on your shirt. You can even run and put on your pants. But you can't run and put on your shoes. <laughs> so the shoes go on first. Very important. Now I learned how to put makeup on at Clown College. It took me seven weeks to come up with a makeup I'm going to put on for you folks tonight. Oh boy, I'll never make it. I'll never make it. All right. I've got to have some powder, some hair. Yeah, that stuff's going to take it off at the end. All right, keep that there. All right. All right, very good. In case I get hungry, I can make some soup. Chunk had just about everything in it. I had uh, some food, granola bars, some cups of soup. I had a couple of things to uh, make soup in, like this thing here. I also had a little cup, cup top thing. Got a little tiny TV in my trunk. Didn't use it ever. Um, never had time to use the TV. Um, I also had a first aid kit in my trunk. There were only two of us on the road that uh, had any first aid background. And it was, turns out it was kind of an important thing to have in my back pocket. So uh, I kept my, my first aid kit in the trunk as well. Um, all right. The two things that nobody's ever going to see again in the United States are the circus train and the circus animals. And it really breaks my heart. Uh, Ringling, well, circus as a, as a form started with animals. Now, I grew up in rural America. I grew up with a horse, and dogs, and cats. Uh, lots of people around had livestock, cows, even some oxen. Horses, stuff like that. So I grew up around animals, and I respect animals, and I, and I know that animals are not always pets. Sometimes they're working animals. And the animals in the circus were working animals. That's what they were there for. And I was a little uncomfortable when I got to the show because <clears throat> I was worried how I was going to feel seeing tigers in those cages. Those tigers, the little ones, were 400 pounds. The big ones were 600 pounds. The cages were eight feet long, so they were kind of small. And uh, I got there, and the first day I walked through the back lot, I got kind of nervous. I'm like, boy, these, these cages don't look big enough. These cats don't seem like they're going to be comfortable to me. And I got inside, and I asked somebody, how do the tigers feel about staying in those cages? And I asked the right person. I asked one of the, one of the guys that was on Animal Crew. <clears throat> and the answer he gave me was, was kind of interesting. He said, well, here's a true story that gives you an idea of the perspective of the tigers on this. In 1974, in the United States, or in North America, something passed called the Endangered Species Act. And ever since then, no wild animals have been used, exhibited, or toured in the United States, in North America at all. All of the animals that Ringling Brothers had had been bred in captivity and had been for generations. 
Um, they, were, they were bred for the purpose of being performing animals. The horses, the cats, the elephants, all of them were, were, were domestic animals. Um, you know, they weren't necessarily pets, but they were working animals. They were, they were bred under, under uh, working, working animal conditions. Um, and what happened in Boston Garden once was uh, the way they got the tigers out of the big cage. There's a big cage that, that Gunther performed in. I toured with Gunther Gable Williams. So I've got some stories about Gunther I'll share with you as well. Anyways, there's this great big cage, and the way they got the tigers out of the cage was they'd line up all those eight-foot uh, cages end-to-end -end and raise both. There's a door at each end. They'd raise all the doors. So a tiger would run and go all the way down the end. They'd drop that door and take that cage away, drop the door on the end. Next tiger would run in. They'd drop that door, take the cage away, drop the next door, turn that tiger in. So that's how they emptied the cage of the tigers. One day in Boston Garden, somebody had a brain cramp, forgot to drop the door when they took the cage away. Tiger ran on in, right out the end. <laughs> Woo! Right down to the back track, the tigers between the audience and the cage. Ooh. Mayhem erupted in oh, Boston no. Garden. People are climbing over each other, trying to get back out of the way. The tiger's just standing there on the, on the floor, just looking around, going, what's this? <laughs> because it was the first time in generations that tiger had not had a cage between it and all the people. And it didn't know what to do. It was probably pretty nervous about it all. Fortunately, there was a working man there who was pretty smart. He realized what to do. He grabbed a cage, brought it around, opened the door, and the tiger jumped right in. Wow. Yep. So it was hearing a story like that that made me realize that these animals really were well cared for. And in fact, the whole time I was on the circus, I never saw an animal getting abused. Wow. The people in the circus were all animal lovers, and it's such an irony that PETA was against the circus people because they took amazingly good care of their animals. All right, I got to get some white stuff on my face. I can't talk and do this at the same time, but it shouldn't take very long. Oh, I forgot to put my skull cap on. That's okay. <laughs> How do I do? I thought I missed a few spots. <laughs> Middle of the nose. That's going to get covered up by something else anyhow. <laughs> I smack it to get it all even. That evens it out. Let's see. Pretty good. Is it pretty close? Yeah. A little pale. <laughs> a little pale. Does it get any eyes? I'm careful not to put it in my eyes. Oh, good. Yeah. If you get it on your contact lens, it'll be there for hours. Oh, Is there a question? Yeah, you've got to be careful about how, how you get your fingers around your eyes. Um, here, let's put this thing on. Okay. David. Do you know why it's not longer? Why it's not what? Why is it not longer anymore? Why, is the why is the circus gone? Yeah. Largely because all over the country, cities started saying, it's, we're not going to let you show off elephants anymore, specifically elephants, and a few, a few other animals too, but it was mostly the elephants, which as a result of PETA, the uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, leading a campaign that lasted for a couple of decades. And it's really interesting. There was a gigantic lawsuit. Uh, yeah. And... Um, PETA lost the lawsuit, millions of dollars. But they'd won over the public opinion, and laws had gotten changed, and they weren't allowed to bring elephants anymore. And when the elephants stopped coming, um, the circus changed dramatically. Um, so I'm here to tell you about the elephants, because they were really cool. Um, as I said, there were 20-some uh, elephants on the road with me. In fact, the main attraction of the circus I was in we were called the King Tusk Tour. And the main attraction was a gigantic elephant. Um, and he was on all the posters. And the, the biggest act in the show, which was called Speck, featured this elephant. But he was not one of Gunther's elephants. Gunther's elephants was a herd that he'd brought over in 1968. Now, a lot of people don't realize the circus had almost died back in the 50s. How many people here saw Ringling Brothers? I've got to ask that question. Hey, wow! Hell yeah! Fantastic. <laughs> Did any of you see it under canvas? No? Did you really? Wait a second. You didn't see Ringling Brothers under canvas. It closed in about 1955, so I'm pretty sure you saw some other. Madison Square Garden. Right, 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 right. Yep, yep, yep. Um, under canvas was an amazing thing. In its heyday, the canvas housed five rings and four stages. 
It took an army of 2,000 men to put it up and take it down, oh. and they did it every day wow. and changed locations every day. So it was a huge undertaking, and it's pretty easy to see that it's probably not going to be sustainable when you're not packing that house every show. In 1968, a guy named um, Irvin Feld bought the circus. He'd been a rock and roll promoter. And he realized if we use all these buildings that are already set up around the country, we don't need to use tents anymore. We can, we can start turning a profit again. So the circus got a little bit smaller, but then he realized there's 100 buildings. I can't get to all of them in a year. I need two circuses. So he looked over at Germany, over in Europe, and there's a circus called Circus Williams, which was uh, featuring this uh, young blonde god called Gunther Gable Williams, who already had all of his horses, all of his elephants, all of his tigers, and he brought the whole circus over at one time. And that started, became the red unit of Ringling Brothers Circus. That is the unit I wound up being on. But when Gunther came over in 1968, not only did he bring all of his animals, he brought all of his crew. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a neat mix of... Uh, uh, Belgians and French and German guys all talking in the back, hanging out, um, dealing with the animals. You know, I, the, the first, my first, don't worry, it's unbreakable, otherwise it would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, um, I forgot to tell you one of, my, one of my other first impressions in the circus. So I walked through the cages, got in the back door, and it was kind of an interesting thing because the circus, the winter quarters, was in the same building I had been in for the previous ten and a half weeks doing clown college. I finished, it was in Venice, Florida. And we finished at Clown College, we took off for two weeks, came back, and the circus had moved into my Clown College. It wasn't Clown College anymore, it was the circus. And I walked through, there's animals everywhere, there's people everywhere, there's all these different, there were seven different languages that were being spoken almost all the time on the show I was on. Um, 125 performers from all over the world. And as I walked through, I went through by the, by the cages, I went inside, and I'd heard that there were going to be Romanians on the show. 1987, Romanians in North America. It didn't happen at the height of the Cold War. This was a big deal. And there had been some special negotiations to bring the Romanians over to the United States. The reason they brought them was because this was, they were from the school that Nadia Comaneci had attended, if you know that name. They did a five-woman high teeterboard act. In fact, they did two of them. So we had two rings with five women high. Now, the women on the bottom were built kind of like me. All right, they were, they were pretty burly. The legs were as big as mine. Their arms were bigger than mine. Um, they were still pretty beautiful, but they were really, really strong. And then as you got progressively higher in the stack, they got smaller and smaller and smaller. So the one on top was about your size. All right. And, uh, yeah, about a, about a 10-year-old kid is, is, I'm guessing, how old she was. Who knows? She was Romanian. She was small. She might have been 16, but um, she was about the size of a regular 10-year-old. And uh, one, of the, one of the other girls who was, I think she was 12 years old, and she was a little bit bigger than you, but not much. Um, I walked in, and there was this Romanian coach who was probably, he was probably 5'6", but was built like a fire plug. He's probably 150, 160 pounds. And in Romania, he's going, one, two, one, two, one, two. And he's getting this girl warmed up. He's the coach. And this little Romanian girl was doing this. One, two, one, two. But what was amazing was, he was standing on her shoulders. <laughs> and I said, whoa, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is a different place. This is a different place. Yep. Circus people tend to be pretty uh, obsessive about their training. Um, and they have to be if you're doing a life or death act. You can't, you can't afford to mess up. So they were always strong. They were always flexible. They took it really seriously. I can't talk while I make this next slide. Excuse me. There we go. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So let me tell you a little bit about, oh, Gunther, Gunther stories. You guys want to hear about Gunther? Yes. Yeah. Um, there's some good stuff about Gunther. Gunther was an animal trainer who trained tigers and horses and elephants. Now, a lot of animal trainers might train them all, but never at the same time. Gunther not only trained all at the same time, he showed them off all at the same time. And there's something that very few lay people recognize about Gunther that was actually quite an accomplishment. Gunther showed off 16 tigers at the same time in the cage. Nobody else shows off 16 tigers at the same time. They might get up to 12, they might get up to 14. But to get 16 tigers in the cage, they have to go around behind you. 
oh and other trainers won't work with the, with the cats behind them. But Gunther worked with the cats behind him, which is an amazing thing. The reason we had 22 tigers on the road and there were only 16 performing is because when a tiger got old, Gunther, Gunther kept it as part with the team. He kept it with the family until it died from natural causes later on. Okay. So we had extra cats that were there that never performed anymore. They'd gotten too old. Um, but Gunther, Gunther still took care of them. Anyhow, um, got to tell you about the sound. <laughs> the sound is something you don't want to hear if you're a circus performer. The sound is what thousands of audience members do when they see something they know they weren't supposed to see. And uh, the first time I heard the sound was with Gunther. It was during Gunther's act. We were filming a TV special. This TV special, actually, you can see it on YouTube. If you uh, enter uh, CBS TV special, Ringling CBS TV special 1987, this will come up on YouTube. They've got pretty much the full thing there. It's a little bit grainy because it came off of VHS, but uh, they've got pretty much the full thing there. And um, we were filming a TV special, so the circus wasn't quite the same as usual because they wanted it to look like the audience was right in the ring. You could sit right down in the circus if you came to the circus. That wasn't the way it usually was. Usually there's a hockey wall all the way around us, and the audience was behind the hockey wall and up in the stands. But because they were filming a TV special, took down the hockey wall, put up chairs down right down behind the, behind the animals. And uh, Gunther had a couple of signature things that he did. One of the things Gunther did, Gunther, by the way, was 56 years old when I joined the show. One of the things Gunther did was he stood on the end of a big, long piece of wood, and he'd back an elephant, he'd go, back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up. And the elephant would back on up to the other side of the ring. Then he would say, hotly, hotly, hotly. The elephant would come lumbering across the floor, stomp on the other end of the board. Gunther would go winging in the air. He'd do a big backflip, and he'd land on the back of another elephant, about 10 feet off the floor. All right, it was awesome. It was amazing. I tried to watch it every show because oh it was God. just amazing. Yep. So that was his, one of his signature things. Another, Gunth, another uh, signature of Gunther was he used to wrap a, a big cat around his shoulders and leave the cage. The cat weighed more than Gunther did, and he would carry this cat out of the cage and then walk, walk, through, the, walk through the arena. Um, I, I can't talk and put this on. Just a second. There we go. Anyways, so we're filming a TV special. We're in St. Pete. We've only been on the road for a, a week and a half, I guess, and we're filming this TV special. Comes to the part of the show. Oh, by the way, you guys are going to get to hear what the sound sounds like. I think, I think, yeah. Um, and so uh, we're at the part of the show where, where Gunther's going to do his backflip, and he's backing the elephant. I'll beg you to beg you to beg you to beg you to. Did I mention that elephants aren't housebroken? <laughs> yeah. So the elephant's backing up towards the audience, <laughs> and its tail goes up, yeah, I know that and mayhem breaks out. <laughs> kind of like what I heard the story with the tiger, except for I saw this. People are, they're in the, the folding chairs. Chairs getting knocked down. People are climbing out of the way backwards like that, because this elephant is just backing up. Its tail's <laughs> up, and it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And pretty much everybody got out of the way, except the old lady in the wheelchair. Oh. You hear it? You hear it? That was it. That was the sound. All right. And that elephant backed right up. There's nothing she could do and unleash the waters of Niagara all over this poor lady. Oh, yep. And, and, and the funny thing is it made it into the TV special. Yeah, they sanitized it a lot. You don't know that an elephant peed on an old lady. But you see the audience going crazy a little bit, and they're like, whoa, it smells bad. And then for some reason that they don't explain, Gunther comes down and gives this old lady a hug. And that was it. And she looked like he'd given her the moon. She was so thrilled. It seemed to be worth being peed on by an elephant to get a hug from Gunther from, from that lady's reaction. So yeah, that was, that was the first time we heard the sound. Um, heard the sound another time that show as well or that, uh, that stand in St. Pete. The, the guest uh, artist was a country western singer named Barbara Mandrell. Yeah. And um, what's that? And, and Barbara Mandrell, was a, she was a singer, and they decided to have her sing from uh, a wagon. Now, this was a prop wagon. It wasn't just a regular old wagon. It was a wagon that we used to change our costumes in the show. 
And it looked like a gypsy wagon, but it probably weighed 4,000 pounds. It was this big, heavy-duty wagon. And the way the act went was we were all out in our opening costumes, which were yellows and oranges and, and reds. And at the, at the blink of an eye, uh, we'd have the showgirls were up on the webs, and they would pop a snap, and it was breakaway costumes, and their gypsy costumes would fall off, and they'd be in their spangles that were uh, green and blue. And when they did that, we all ducked into this, all hundred, the rest of the hundred of us went through this wagon, and in about 30 seconds, we all came out the other side dressed in greens and blues and, sp and spangles. Yeah. So the whole show changed colors at the, in the blink of an eye. Um, this wagon is an important character in this story. Um, the wagon was pulled by a Percheron, this gigantic, beautiful horse, you know, one of Gunther's prize horses. And it was a wonderful, gentle horse. And uh, this happened actually uh, sometime after midnight, probably about 2 o'clock in the morning. They, um, some of the TV special they filmed in the middle of the night because they wanted to get different shots with the audience in the background. Uh, and so what they did was they advertised, free circus, come at midnight. And they got about 400 people in St. Pete that came. And when they did a shot this way, they had, everybody sit up there. Now everybody sit over there. We're going to shoot this way. And so the whole audience would run around and, and sit in different places. And uh, they had set up uh, the wagon with Barbara's monitor. And one of the things you hear circus people talk about is the importance of having circus people work with animals and not production companies. And this is a perfect example of why. Um, as they were, right after they had set up Barbara's monitor, somebody turned on a speaker and it fed back. What? <laughs> That's what the horse did. <laughs> Only worse. This was a gigantic horse. It had a groom on each side holding onto the bridle, but that horse took off. Nobody was in the wagon yet, but the horse took off. And I remember watching it tear off around the end of ring one and come down the front track. And as it was coming down the front track, both of those guys were just hanging on for dear life. They can't run, they can't keep up. One of them lost his grip at ring one, blah, 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 rolled off into the bull tubs. He was pretty much okay. Oh my Horse kept running though. It was just getting more scared and more scared. It's got this wagon bucking around behind it. Stuff's falling off the wagon. It's charging down the front track, goes past ring two, goes past ring three, goes around a corner to get out by ring three. The other poor guy lost his grip. Oh, no. He went under the wagon. <gasps> He didn't get to stay with us. He, he, had, he had to stay behind. I don't know if he joined the show later on or not. I never got to know that guy. Um, horse went around the back. And you know in, in civic centers and big government buildings, there are gigantic steel doors that are probably 14 feet tall and 14 <coughs> feet across. That's what was in the back of this building. The horse came around the back, tore through the back of the building, got to that door, and then boom, boom, like it was tinfoil, right under the parking oh lot. My God. The horse is now out of its mind crazy. It's tearing around the parking lot with this wagon, bouncing off of cars, bouncing off of, of trailers, wagons. People are running for their lives to get out of the way because this horse is totally crazy insane, tearing around, killing things. And Gunther heard what was going on, jumped out of his buff bus, and Gunther, who was about this tall, ran out and went, whoa, and the horse stopped with his nose in his hand. Wow. That was Gunther. Oh, my God. That was Gunther. Yep, he really, uh, he really did speak a different language than the rest of us, and he was a Dr. Doolittle. He could talk to those animals. Different kind of relationship. Oh, uh, that's sad. Well, it was sad, but it worked out okay. Gunther was able to put a stop to it. Let's see. Oh, elephants. So uh, one of my favorite memories of the elephants was uh, being in Madison Square Garden. And the elephants were great. They're a family. Uh, almost all the elephants in the circus are, are females because uh, elephants go through musk. If you know about moose, you know about musk. Mm -hmm. Some other animals go through musk. Elephants do that too. So they're not, uh, they generally don't keep the males around. We had two males in, uh, in the show when I was there. One of them was named Congo. He was a little African elephant. And the other one was uh, King Tusk, was a male elephant. But uh, this memory is from the, from the girls. Uh, they're, they're still called bulls, even though they're all females. All the circus people still call them the bulls, um, or the ladies. And uh, this memory is from being in Madison Square Garden well after midnight. I'd stayed late working on something. I don't remember what it was anymore. But as I was leaving, there was nothing but the emergency lighting on in, in Madison Square Garden. So the whole gigantic place is all quiet and empty. And all the elephants are, are lined up side by side by side. 
And the elephants would be on two long chains. There's a long chain in front, long chain behind them, and then they have a, a chain that goes from their, from their ankle to the, to the rest of the chains, and there's four tie-downs on the floor. I've got to share this with you because I think it's so funny. Whenever elephants are chained up outdoors, which, which is often the case, except when they're indoors, they still use the stakes into the ground, and they put these big long chains on, and that's how, what keeps the elephants there. Do you know how they get the stakes out? Elephant. An elephant, <laughs> right. They give it a command, the elephant goes over, grabs the string, bloop, pulls the stake out. Those elephants can leave any time they want, and they know it, but they got no reason to leave. They're, they're, they're there to work, and they, and they love working. Um, anyways, it's dim darkness, Madison Square Garden. There's 24 elephants lined up, shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder in the dark. And it's after midnight, and they're dancing. <laughs> and there's 24 elephants just grooving in the darkness, just going back and forth like that. The elephants were so cool. They were so cool. I did not get to ride an elephant, and I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. Another great memory of an elephant was um, I had to mix soap. Now, uh, uh, when, uh, if you see the Three Stooges have a pie fight, you guys know what I'm talking about? Going back a few years there. They didn't put pie in pies, you put shaving cream in pies, especially if you're going to do them in the circus because your costume's not going to get washed for another, I don't know, two, three dozen shows. So you don't want anything in it that's going to, yeah, I know. You don't want anything in it that's going to get even worse. So you use soap, you use shaving soap. I had to whip up 60 gallons of soap every show. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was the first of May. It was one of my, one of my jobs I had to do. And uh, usually I could do it during one show so be ready for the next show. Um, and I would do it during spec. I'm sorry, during, it was called manage, which I think is short for menagerie. And that was the act that the elephants, Gunther's elephants performed in. And uh, the year I was there, it was a break dancing number. He had a few elephants that break, were, were break dancers. And uh, we had a bunch of, bunch of break dancers from Brooklyn and the Bronx. And they all, they all worked together. And the show girls and their Romanian girls would ride the elephants. I have a couple of memories from this, uh, this uh, shot in the show. Uh, I was in the building, and the, uh, the doorway was irregular. Usually, they're 12 or 14 feet tall. In this building, but let me, let me powder my lit here so I don't. Have so much trouble talking. <laughs> Anyways, the doorway was only about 11 feet tall. Oh. This is baby powder, it's just cornstarch. Oh, yeah. um, elephants are about 10 feet tall. These elephants have showgirls and Romanian acrobats riding them. Elephants don't care, it's only an 11 foot door. <laughs> They're still going full speed. And I watch these elephants come down this tunnel, and the showgirls realize, low bridge, and just go, ah! And just lie flat on their backs as these elephants charge through the door, and they'll just pop up, ta, ah, on the other side. Cool. It was great. It was great. Yeah. Another memory of Gunther, same kind of a situation. The elephants are charging out on the floor. Gunther did this act dressed in a tuxedo. And uh, I have mentioned the elephants weren't housebroken, right? <laughs> So there were barrels with shovels and sawdust in them every so often. And uh, I remember seeing Gunther one day as the elephants were going out to do spec. He was behind the group for a little bit. And he was going at a full gallop, running full speed in a tuxedo. And he went by this barrel and he picked up a shovel, never broke stride. There was a plop on the floor right about there. As he went by, he didn't slow down, whoosh, left a bit of a wet spot and nothing else. Got to another barrel. Boom! In the barrel, and then ha! Out on the floor when he went through the curtain. It was great. Yep, yep. Backstage was a little bit different than the rest. Um, anyways, the story I wanted to tell you about, mixing the soap. I'm mixing the soap, and this was a weird building because there were two doors. The elephants went in this door. Usually there's only one door. You'd go in one door and you'd come out the same door. This building had two doors. So the elephants were going in this door. They were running around. Then they had to stand in a queue over here. Apparently this floor was a little bit too small for all of them to be there. So they were coming up and they were queuing up over here. And there was a door down at that end of the building, you know, a big double door like you see in any school or any auditorium, yeah. double door. And it turns out one double door is exactly the same size as an elephant butt <laughs> because it was perfectly filled 
by one elephant butt. <laughs> and that elephant got an itch. And it decided to scratch. <laughs> and I got to watch this door just plaster dust flying everywhere. Woo -ba, woo -ba, woo -ba, woo -ba, woo -ba, woo -ba, woo -ba. As this one elephant butt got, got, got scratched. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was great. The elephants were so cool. And you know, they say elephants have a great memory. Um, and I've heard the story I'm about to tell you many times, actually. Um, but the last time I heard it was about a year ago. It was from a showgirl who'd, who'd ridden an elephant in the show for a couple of years when she was there. The handler for that elephant had said, you know, if you bring a piece of apple whenever you ride the elephant and give the elephant a piece of apple, it'll be friendly all the time to you. And so she did that, but it got to the point where as soon as she walked up to the elephant, the trunk would go out in her pocket, grab the apple, <laughs> hello, how you doing? And then she'd go and ride the show, ride, ride the elephant. Like 20 years had gone by since she'd been on the show. She went back to visit the show. She didn't even know she'd know anybody there. She walked down. It was, it was Gunther's elephants. It was the old elephants. She's walking down the line of elephants, and she saw a guy that she recognized. And she's about to say, hey, is my elephant here? I don't know what the elephant's name was, Rosie or something like that. Hey, is Rosie still here? And before she gets the words out of her mouth, a trunk comes out of the group, reaches into her pocket, starts feeling around for an apple. <laughs> and it was the same elephant. It recognized her decades later, even though it had been through many, many other writers since then. Yep, it knew her. Pretty neat stuff. All right, let's see. We got it. What's that, David? What's that? I didn't know Nicole. Nicole was a little tiny girl when I was there. He asked if I knew that, that Kenneth Feld's daughters, uh, who were in charge of the show, when the show folded. Um, no, I don't, I don't know them. I didn't get to know them. Um, no, I knew their father. I did not get to meet their grandfather, I'm sorry to say. Now, there was something else here. Ah, there it is. Brush my powder off. Let me tell you about the train. The train was great. My room was small, but as I said, it was enough. And it was wonderful to have a home to go to every night, not a motel room, not a hotel room. It was my room. And, it, and I had done my room up. I was pretty happy with it. Um, all the rooms were like a, uh, a dinette and a diner. You know, it was a bench like this and a table in the middle. And the table could come off a bit between the benches. You flop the cushions down, that was where you slept. Um, I was pretty much average or a little short for a clown on Ringling Brothers at the time. Almost everybody was more than six feet tall. So we all learned to sleep corner to corner in the rooms because that was the only way you could fit in there. And um, one of my fond memories was uh, at night, uh, loadout night specifically. Well, let me tell you, I'll paint the picture of the loadout night. On a loadout night, you, you do your... You do your three shows on Saturday, three shows on Sunday. You're pretty tired. You do load out. So I'd have to go in. As soon as the last note finished from the band, me and the rest of the army of the clowns with makeup on, but without their costumes on, would charge out onto the floor, acrobats, and we'd start tearing the show down. Um, the show was big. It took uh, between four and six hours usually to load it in. But two hours after that last note was played, the only way you'd know the circus had been in that room was by the trash in the stands and the smell of the elephants and the tigers, because that would stay for a long time. But the circus was gone two hours after the show ended, because we had to get it loaded on the train. The train had to, f had to go at night, because we were the lowest priority on the tracks, so we could do the most mileage during the night. So we had to get that train loaded up. Anyways, my, my cherry pie job ended as soon as I got all the cables off the rig, folded up in, a in, a, in the wagons, off they went. I go back to the train. People start showing up at the train. Uh, train yard is generally not a very scenic place. It's generally one of the ugliest places in town. But for the circus, it was home for us. And there'd be barbecues all the way down the train. And all these different spices. Afri South Africans would have their kind of spices. The Romanians had their kind of spices. The Brits didn't have any spices at all. <laughs> and we'd all be cooking and grilling and, and carrying on. And at some point or other, the train would move. Now, the, the train was not being driven by passenger train drivers. It was being driven by freight train drivers. So when it moved, it went wham, 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 wham. And this shock wave would go a mile down the train as they're hooking the train up. And that was your cue that it's time to leave. So you start packing up everything, because they didn't take attendance. You just had to be on when it left. Um, so you'd start cleaning up the barbecue, picking everything up. You go up and you get it in your room. Um, you made dinner, whatever. It's, it's, about, it's usually about 1 or 2 in the morning at this point, because you wouldn't get home till 11 or 12. Um, and, you're on, and you're in your room, and so there's this whole hallway. There's a fun picture in there of, of the hallway um, of just a bunch of doors. There's no windows in the hallway. It's just all doors, sliding doors. And there'd be all these feet sticking out into the hallway mm -hmm. of all these guys, all these tall guys that haven't quite gone to bed yet. And as soon as the train moved, 
That was it. That meant it was time to go to bed. And I remember watching the hallway one night as all these long legs folded up into the rooms and the doors all shut, all up and down, all up and down. And uh, I had a loft in my room. So I had actually a guest bedroom in my room. And uh, my loft, I would set the radio to some, to some station that I was going to listen to. And as soon as the train started moving, it was like, you know, it just put you out. It was like being in a cradle getting rocked to sleep. And the cool thing was, the next morning when I woke up, the radio would still be on. And if it was lucky enough to have a station, the DJ would have a different dialect. I'd be in a different part of the country completely, and they, they wouldn't be speaking the same way. That was a pretty neat thing. All right. Anybody see where my mirror went? Doggone, I'm never going to make it. Whoa. Is that really the time, 6.53? Am I supposed to stop in seven minutes? I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to, I'm never going to make it. <laughs> oh man. All right. So when this happened in the circus, <laughs> the alley would be there to support you because everybody knew how long everybody else took to put their makeup on. Got a spare. <laughs> everybody knew how long it took to put their makeup on. And if somebody was late, like maybe somebody else in the alley had turned the clock back a little bit. <laughs> so the last guy in wouldn't know that. And so everybody else would be ready to go and be like, what's the matter with you? You know, you've only got one minute to go. <laughs> what? <laughs> so in support, the entire alley would line up behind that person and go, you could not put your makeup on with six guys doing that behind you. There's no way. No way. Yeah, that's going to cost you 10 bucks. All right. Let's see. Uh, water stops. <laughs> so the train has to stop every 10 hours or so to water the animals. Most of our, most of our uh, um, trips didn't last more than overnight, you know, or partially into the next day. But sometimes we did, we did a three-day three overland from Philadelphia to uh, El Paso, Texas. And so the train has to stop and water the animals. And uh, once again, they don't take attendance. They don't wait. If you get off and the train leaves, you're stuck. Did any of you meet Randy Johnson last year? One of my friends came to coach at the camp last year that I ran up in Norwich. He got stuck in Pocatoa, Idaho, with his pajamas and a six-pack of beer. <laughs> he gotten off the train to get the beer. He spent all his money on the beer. Yep, it took him a while to catch up to the rest of us. Um, anyways, this story is about... Uh, this actually isn't my story that I'm going to tell you. This is a story featuring um, Nasty. And Nasty was a clown named Kevin McDonald. He was a little person. Um, and they'd been on a train run that had gone on for a few days. All the chips were gone. All the beer was gone. All the soda was gone. And they pulled in, and the train stopped. And the animals traveled at the front of the train. The clowns traveled at the back. It's hard to communicate to the front of the train. You didn't know if it was a water stop or not, unless you found somebody with a walkie-talkie. And, of course, if it was an actual water stop, the guys with the walkie-talkies took off immediately because <laughs> they knew it was going to be a while. They could go off and get their beer and their pizza and whatever and whatever. But the clowns would be left behind, not knowing what's going on, scratching their heads. And off in the distance, from the vestibule of the clown car, was this neon sign flashing, pizza, beer, pizza, beer. It's about a half a mile away, but you could see it real easily from the clown car. Nobody knows whether it's a water stop or not. But they're like, it's got to be a water stop. It's got to be. What are the chances it's not a water stop? It's about time for a water stop. I think we can make it. You think we can make it? We can make it. Let's go for it. So about five of the clowns jump off, including Nasty. And they book across. The it's this open field between the train and the, and the, and the diner, or whatever, the pizza place. And they fly across the pizza place and they get in. Now, Nasty's got his nickname for a reason, all right? He's kind of abrupt. He's kind of, kind of coarse. And he gets in there and he's like, I want a pizza and I want a six pack of beer and give it to me now. Quick, quick, quick. I got a train to catch. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> all right, so he's kind of intense. And oh, the pizza people are like this. And he's there, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And nothing there looking in. Chain hasn't left yet. Come on, let's go. Let's go. And it hasn't left yet. It hasn't left yet. So finally, they get him the pizza. He's got a pizza. Like, yeah. He's got a six pack of beer. And he leaves. <laughs> and they start running out and they're, they're kind of walking kind of fast. All of a sudden, <laughs> oh, no. you can hear it before you can see it. And the train starts to move. All the other guys are six feet tall with long legs. Great athletes. <laughs> like gazelles, they're gone. 
But there's poor little Nasty with his little legs going, oh, come on, guys, come on. And he's running along, like, come on, Nasty, you can, oh, come on, guys, oh, wait for me. And he's running around, the beers fall out of his six pack, oh, guys, I know. He's running along, the box on his streets is flopping around like this, guys, wait for me, wait for me. Train is moving along like this, come on, Nasty, come on. All the guys are in the clunker, like, come on, Nasty, you can do it, you can do it. Oh, wait for me, the pizza's flopping out of his box, ah, ah. And he runs down, they reach down, they grab him, they pull him up onto the vestibule. And the train stops. <laughs> it was a water stop. They're just moving to the next car. <laughs> Poor nasty. Yeah. Life on the road in the train. Am I late yet? Whoa! I'm never going to make it. All right. Have you guys got any questions? Usually I get to answer some questions. Anybody have a question? Did you ever have any time at home or at home when you're. Did I have any time at home when I was on the circus? Did you have a home when you were in the circus besides the train? Well, Vermont. <laughs> but no, I didn't get to spend much time here. The tour was 50 weeks a year. Oh, wow. Um, I got to come back a couple of times. I got to go skiing. I made a trip back on one of our Overland trips. Took some runs at Killington, um, which was epic because you had to get the right combination of buses and everything to get it to work to get back as well. Um, but yeah, no, the, the life was in the circus. And, and that's, that's an interesting thing. The, the circus was a family, it really was. The people on the show were very tight, they were very close. Um, even if you didn't know each other very well, you got to be pretty close. Um, I should put together another whole show just about the Romanians and the relationships I had with the rela Romanians. Um, I want to show you something real quick about makeup. I'm going to be late now, but I'm going to show you this because it's important. Hans, have a bad rap of being scary. And scary clowns happen because there's people out there that put on makeup and they don't know how to do it very well. And if you've only got one expression on your face, that's scary. That's unnatural. And uh, the show, Greatest Show on Earth, the movie, had Jimmy Stewart made up with this great big smile painted on his face. That makeup was not put on him by a circus person. That makeup was put on by a Hollywood person. Circus clowns, and it took me a long time to get my face to work, but circus clowns have to be able to express a full range of emotion way out there because you can't talk. You can't talk to your audience in the circus. So your face and your body are what you use to express stuff. And if I'm going uh, to be happy, I'm going to be happy. And my makeup smiles. But I also have to be, in order to not be scary, I have to be able to be sad. And to be sad, I've got to be able to be sad too. So a good makeup actually amplifies your emotions. It doesn't just project one thing out there. And I'm afraid that there are so many people out there now with bad makeups that clowns have got a bad reputation and it's, it's really too bad. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> now most clowns have red noses, it is traditional. Um, I did not have traditional makeup on my, on my face. Um, but it served me pretty well. So I will keep my trademark blue nose. It's held on with surgical adhesive? Yeah, wow. <laughs> I used to invite kids to pull on my nose. Because they would say, you're not a real clown. I'd say, yeah, how do you know? They'd say, your nose is fake. I said, give it a tug. And they couldn't get it off. There we go. All right. Um, this is when I'm going to mute this and put on my shirt. Oh boy. Ten dollar fine already. <laughs> Could any clown wear any other clown's makeup or is the makeup unique to the clown? Could any clown wear any other clown's makeup? That's an excellent question. No two faces are exactly the same. So while you can copy somebody else's makeup, it's probably not going to be the same as their makeup. Um, however, in the year and a half I was on the show, guess how many shows I did? Oh, God, 600. More. 400. More than 600. 400. No. 773. Oh. In a year and a half. Wow. So the show, the show I remember thinking after 100 shows, I've got it. It's routine. And I remember thinking after 125, it's getting a little bit boring. <laughs> I 
we did it 773. Oh my. I'm telling you that because every once in a while when you got out on the floor, you might look at another clown and it's kind of like looking in a mirror. Well, what's my makeup doing over there? It's supposed to be on me. Because just for the fun of it, you put on somebody else's makeup and go out on the floor. <laughs> so it would happen. This wig has seen better days, but it's okay. I brought the, uh, I brought a cure for bad hair. <laughs> There's one more story I really want to leave you folks with. It's one of my favorites. Um, we were getting <coughs> ready to do dress rehearsal. Whoop! The very first dress rehearsal. And so, as I told you, our big spec number was uh, King Tusk. Oh, I forgot to turn that back on. We there? Yeah. All right. Um, so this story is about dress rehearsal, and our big number was King Tusk. And uh, the number was a display of this gigantic elephant. And according to the Ringling propaganda, he was 14,000 pounds. Now, I don't know whether or not that's true, but that's what they said. Uh, they said he was 10 feet tall at the shoulder. That's true. He was at least that tall at the shoulder. He was big. Um, I got to see him once sit up on a bull tub and raise up, and his trunk could have touched the ceiling here, I'm pretty sure. Um, he was huge. Um, he had one tusk. Oh, I've got, I've got him here. Uh, he had one tusk that was eight feet long. Oh. The other tusk was only six feet long. It had broken off because there had been a car accident. He traveled in a trailer. He tipped over and broken off the end of one of his tusks oh. in the trailer. I did some, some back of the napkin mathematics one day, and I calculated he had over 400 pounds of teeth sticking out of his head. Oh. Yeah, his tusks were bigger than me. All right, you, you starting to understand this? They were huge. Um, he had a trunk. His trunk was about nine feet long. An elephant's trunk is an amazing thing. It was made out of about... Elephant trunks have about 40,000 different muscles in it. And I once saw this elephant pick up Gunther and throw him about 10 feet with his trunk. Oh, my God. Yeah, he was saying, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> yeah. And Gunther listened and respected that from then on as well. Um, yeah, he had feet the size of, of, a, of a trash barrel. His foot was about this big around. Yep. And he had, uh, well, he was, just, he was just huge. And the, 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 the ringmaster sang a song uh, to him is uh, from east of the Himalaya, across the Indian Ocean, King Tusk. Well, actually, his name was Tommy, and he came from Cincinnati, but nobody had to know that. <laughs> yeah. And for dress rehearsal, we all had these really cool costumes. It started out as a, as a number where we were all Victorian in, in, in uh, commemoration of Dumbo, or Jumbo, which had come over in the 1800s. So there's a, a bunch of uh, performers went out in this Victorian costumes. Then they changed costumes to go out with the rest of us again as Arabian Nights. I had this great costume. There's a picture of it in there somewhere. I had this great costume had um, big gold poofy sleeves and big gold poofy pants and it was like this purple vest thing. Had a gold turban with a purple feather on top and had these gold shoes, it was great. Yeah, and uh, all the show guys had costumes of a similar kind of a thing as Arabian Nights. All the show girls had these Arabian Nights costumes and the, the whole thing was to show off this big elephant, King Tusk. First dress rehearsal, we were told to be ready for dress rehearsal at four o'clock in the afternoon. So we're out there, we've got our costumes on, we're out there. They haven't figured out how to get Tommy's costume on him yet. Turned out his costume weighed over 2,000 pounds. Oh my God. They needed a forklift. Oh my God. His costume had a blanket that went up and over his back from one side to the other. Obviously, it's over 20 feet long like this, and it was really thick. It was covered with, with lace and jewels and mirrors and all kinds of stuff. And it had a train that came out the back like this, went up behind him, and there were six Romanian acrobats that marched along and carried his train out behind him. On his ankles, he had these great big bracelets that went around, and they had sleigh bells on him, so he walked around, ka -chink, ka -chink, ka -chink like that. And he had this gold mask that came down over his trunk in the front. On his ears, he had these things. If you had them at your house, you'd call them chandeliers. But on him, they were just earrings. They just came down one after the other like this. On his back, he had this gold hoda, which was this big onion-looking thing. And then Marky rode on his back like that so he could hook up the hoda. And when he got out into the middle ring, uh, the rest of us would come in and he had a pedestal that spun around. We'd spin the pedestal around and King Tusk would twirl around like that. Yeah, that was the idea. But they didn't have a forklift ready when it was time to start dress rehearsal, so it took a while, and we waited and we waited. Finally, it was probably about 8 o'clock, they said, okay, let's do dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I was given the dubious honor of marching directly behind the largest non-housebroken land mammal traveling the face of the There he is. Yep, yep, there we go. Um, so, so uh, 
I was right behind Tommy, and then there was uh, Christina and the Wolfhounds and the Llamas. Um, and they said, go! And we marched out into the ring for the first time. Doom, 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 doom. We got halfway around the track, and Roy the choreographer goes, stop, 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 the showgirls are all wrong in ring one. Everybody freeze. So we stopped. We waited, and we waited, and we waited. You see, what happened was there's 125 performers on the floor at the same time, and about two dozen animals, and they had crisscrossed in ring one. They couldn't all be there at the same time. It was a problem, so Roy just straightened it out. So we waited, and we waited. We were there for 10 minutes. We were there for 20 minutes, just waiting. Just waiting. Tommy got a little bit bored. All of a sudden, I've got the biggest butt traveling the face of the earth, <laughs> dancing back and forth in front of me like this. So Tommy dances for a little while, and then Lee's, Lee's handler says, stop it, Tommy, cut it out, cut it out. So Tommy stops, and he's sitting there, and his trunk starts feeling around like this, and he goes over, <laughs> and he finds Lee. And he goes up, and he starts snorting around, and Lee, and he says, cut it out, Tommy. And Tommy stopped, and his trunk went down on the other side. There was a working man over on that side. Tommy's trunk went over the working man. He's like, and Tommy's up there and Lee says, cut it out, Tommy. And Tommy stopped it. He's down there. We're there for another 10 minutes. It's an eternity. We're there forever. Tommy's trunk wandered around on the floor and then it wandered over and it found his leg. And it found that little anklet that he had on. And it found one of those sleigh bells. And he grabbed that sleigh bell and it blink! And he pulled off that bell. And then he put it down on the floor. And that elephant with a foot the size of a barrel 14,000 pounds on the top of that bell, and he went and he started playing with the bell. And me and six Romanians go, that's cool. And this big old elephant was just as happy as he could be playing with the bell. Just making that bell ring around and around and around. Roy fixed everything in ring one. They got it straightened out. They said, let's go. Lee said, move out. And Tommy went, scrunch. Oh, and he smushed it into the floor. And I wish I'd gone back my jackknife and dug it out, but I never did. It would have been a great souvenir. But I remember walking by going, yep, that's what's going to happen to that bell. That was going to happen. Yeah. Oh, anyways, it's just about time for the whistle. But guess what? Oh, where's my vest? Does anybody have any questions or experiences you would like to share? Because there are. Yes, miss. Um, how, what's the fastest record of time before getting a costume on and all your makeup? What's the fastest record of time for getting your costume on and your makeup? This is very circumstantial dependent. All right. So for example, um, if you just show up late and your trunk is there, you're going to be pretty good at getting your makeup on. Now, if you're asking for me personally, or for overall, how fast can a clown put their makeup on? Uh, for you. I probably have never done it in less than 10 or 12 minutes. Wow. All right, but that was when a car broke down on the way to the job. On the way, I was, I was staying in a friend's house, car broke down on the way there, took, was epic getting there, and I charged in and had 12 minutes, and I, I was able to make it. Um, my makeup didn't look very good, but I was able to make it. Um, there are many stories of clowns having to improvise on the way in. The car breaks down. They don't have the makeup. Something else goes on. It's usually as a result of doing publicity, because when we did publicity, we weren't at our trucks. We'd be out on the road somewhere doing, doing publicity. And uh, there's a great story of, of one of the guys who was out, and he remembers makeup kit, but he forgot his powder sock. So he's, he's getting ready. He's coming back from doing from his stuff. He's stayed overnight somewhere else. He's coming back, and he's the end of the running late. So he's going to put his makeup on in the car. He puts his makeup on the car. He doesn't have his powder sock. What are we going to do? Oh, there's some flour in the car. They've been shopping. He powders his face with flour. It was self-rising flour. <laughs> and he got to the arena, his face had puffed out. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's certain, certain things you learn along the way to avoid. But, yeah, you can put it on pretty fast. I remember my friend Peter Bufano. Uh, Peter Bufano is actually, uh, how many people here have seen Circus Smirkus? I'll do that, Yeah. Peter Bufano is a composer that writes a lot of music for Circus Smirkus. And he's actually written music for circuses all over the world. But he and I went to clown college together. And I remember Peter used to take... Oh, that's Peter right there. Uh, yeah. Peter used to take over an hour to put his makeup on every day. Uh, and it takes forever, 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 forever. And we had an early morning PR, like 5.30 in the morning. We had to go crash radio stations or something like that. 
And so uh, we took our makeup back with us. We're on the train. I couldn't get Peter to wake up. Like, Peter, wake up. We gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. I thought, finally I thought, I guess he's not in his room. And the door opens. Peter's there. He just couldn't wake up. I was like, Peter, let's go. He's got about six minutes to get his makeup on. And he's like, it's better than it's ever been. I'm never gonna spend 10 minutes on my makeup ever again. And uh, yeah, yep, so it was, it was a pretty good makeup. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's, uh, okay. Um, yeah. Is it because there's ticket sale? Is that why? What's is that? that? Is it because there's ticket sale? From the ticket sales? Yeah, is that, is that why they took the Oh, why they stopped? Yeah. Ah, uh, so the question is why did Ringling stop? And it definitely has to do with money. Um, yeah. When I was on the road, I got paid $185 a week, wow. uh, which was the lowest paying job I'd had since I babysat in high school. <laughs> um, and there was an article in I don't know if it was Fortune Magazine or Forbes Magazine about Kenneth Feld, the owner of the circus, who was making $50 million a year. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I was one of the lowest paid people in business, and that was my boss. And uh, that, was, that was interesting. So, so his, his standard of how much money I have to make to make it keep going is pretty high. And as more competition entered the market, Cirque du Soleil, um, other circuses, started to take more market share away. This is back before the year 2000. Um, they started to lose some market share. Um, and they started trying some other things. They did one thing, they installed a big TV for everybody to watch during the circus. I didn't think that was a very good idea. Um, they went from three rings down to one ring in these gigantic places. Not a very good idea. All right, they started decreasing the number of clowns they had. When I was there, there were 26. Uh, when the show closed, I think there were nine. Um, when I was on the road, we had 20, like 26 elephants. I don't know exactly how many there were. There were seven when the show closed, um, which makes me really sad because the circuses aren't going to last without that gene pool. Um, or that the elephants aren't going to last without that gene pool. So it did have to do with economics, but it also had to do with Kenneth Feld gave it to his daughters. So now there's three people that want to make as much as that one guy used to make. And they said it's not feasible. I do not know why they killed it the way they killed it, but they killed it. Um, all the elephants are gone. They have a sanctuary down there, but they're gone. I think there's like six or seven elephants in the sanctuary. Um, the train, they sold off what they could of the train and the leftover cars, they scrapped. Oh my God. They chopped them up. Yeah, yeah. So that was it. That was the end of the, the silver slug. Wow. Um, That's also the ticket sale. Well, I don't know if it's about ticket sales or not. It's, it's about, th there's a funny story, an interesting story about uh, when Irvin Feld owned the circus back in the 70s, he sold it to Mattel the toy maker, but he kept the right to the concessions. And so Mattel ran the circus, you know, took in the ticket sales, paid for the animals, all the projection, all, but all Kenneth Feld did, or Irvin Feld did, was he sold the concessions. Two years later, he bought it back with the money he'd made from the concessions. So it's not necessarily ticket sales, but it's getting them in the door and then selling them the other stuff. Yes? How many female clowns? Did How many female clowns? Mm -hmm. When I was on the road, out of the 26 of us, there were four women on the road that were performing as clowns. My sister, I'm proud to tell you, went to clown college okay. two years after I did. Yep, yep. Um, it was a hard place to be a woman. It was, uh, it was uh, definitely a, a male-dominated uh, environment completely. So those, those women had to work hard. Um, but they were tough, and they were really hard workers. In fact, Everybody in the circus was a really hard worker. Um, it didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter what language you spoke. It didn't matter whether you were an atheist or Jewish or Christian or Hindu or Muslim. Didn't matter. Any of that stuff didn't matter at all. Didn't matter what your orientation was, sexual orientation. None of that mattered. If you did your job, the circus would embrace you. And, and, and it was really home to a lot of people that hadn't found a place where they were happy before. Um, which was really interesting because that was a change that happened at the end of the 20th century. Uh, up until about the 50s, the only way to get into the circus was to have family that were in the circus because you had to learn it from them. And then, um, you know, American uh, middle class would start running away to join the circus. In 1968, Clown College was established, and that's when guys like me started to get to go to the circus. Uh, Clown College was a way in for middle class Americans to get into the circus. Yeah, and so it, it started to uh, have, have a broader uh, group of people in it then. The showgirls were from all over the world, but they would audition professional dancers in New York City. So those were the other, the other women that were on the show. Yeah. What do you study at 
climatologist. What do you study a climatologist? <laughs> See, that's another one hour show. Um, but uh, we wake up, we put on makeup for an hour every day. After we put on makeup, we do 40 minutes of calisthenics. After calisthenics, we had a bunch of classes. We had arena choreography. We had slaps and falls. We had gag riding. Um, slaps and falls. There was a, uh, we did, we had slaps and falls. I love teaching slaps and falls, it's a blast. Um, we had some acrobatics, uh, stilt walking. Uh, if, you were, if you were gonna walk stilts, we walked up to 11 foot stilts at Clown College. Um, I got up to six footers and I fell off. I went up to eight and that was it for me. I was in, uh, um, the uh, pyrotechnics, we had pyrotechnics, acrobatics. Um, let's see, oh, juggling, unicycling, a bunch of skills. There was a little bit of wire work that was being done there. Um, I was on a trampoline squad. I was on a, um, there was also a um, mountain biking squad, on, or not mountain, a BMX squad. Um, because of my, my unicycle skills. I was already a skilled unicyclist when I went to Clown College. They had me doing BMX bikes as well. The alley served not only to entertain people, the alley was also the pool of talent if a performer got hurt. They'd say, do you know how to catch somebody on a trapeze? And somebody in the alley was able to say, yup, and up they went for the next show. Um, and, and then that night they'd drill for a few hours and make sure they were as good as they thought they were. But yeah, so the alley was a pool. So they, they had me train BMX. I never did that. I wasn't nearly as good as the guys that did it in the show. Yes? Why did you want to become a clown? Why did I want to become a clown? Boy, that's a great question. Um, I like making people laugh. I have a lot of fun making people laugh. So that's, that's, that's the, the bottom line for me. Yeah. Um, it was a, for me, it was a great adventure, and it has been ever since, because this, this costume has taken me, it took me all over the United States in a little tiny room. After I left the circus, it took me to Russia. Uh, back in 1990, I got to go to Russia as part of a cultural exchange. Once again, there weren't any Americans over in that part of the world at that time. Of, in that time. It was a really cool experience. You represented America. I did. The Ringling America, <laughs> the, ringling, the Ringling Clown, which they didn't have anything like this at all over there. I was a real oddity over there. Um, but yeah, no, it's actually, this costume went over there. It's the same thing. Um, uh, I've been to Singapore, I've been to China, I've been to Africa. It's taken me all over the world, and I really enjoy that. And I love meeting people from all over the world, and it's been great for that, too. So clowning, it's not just a way to make people laugh. It's a way to get some mileage out of it and go and see, see the rest of the world. That's why I did it. All right. Thank you, folks.